of a brand new excellent five-parter in Jack and Ori. It's called uh, George's Marvellous Medicine. Whatever you do, don't mess about with medicine yourself. If I were you, I'd leave it to the expert George. And it's told today by the fantastically funny Rick Mail. Don't miss a bit of this. <laughs> shopping in the village, George's mother said to George on Saturday morning. So be a good boy and don't get up to mischief. Well, this is a silly thing to say to a small boy at any time. It immediately made him wonder what sort of mischief he might get up to. And don't forget to give Grandma her medicine at 11 o'clock, his mother said. Then out she went, closing the back door behind her. Grandma, who was dozing in her chair by the window, opened one wicked little eye and said, now you heard your mother, George. Don't forget my medicine. No, Grandma, said George. And just try and behave yourself for once while she's away. Yes, Grandma, said George. Looking after that grisly old grunion of a grandma all by himself was hardly the most exciting way to spend a Saturday morning. His father was a farmer, and the farm they lived on was miles away from anywhere, so there was never any children to play with. And he was tired of staring out the window at, at pigs and cows and hens and sheep. You can make me a nice cup of tea for a start, Grandma said to George. That'll keep you out of mischief for a few minutes. <sighs> yes, Grandma, said George. He couldn't help disliking Grandma. She was a selfish, grumpy old woman. She had pale brown teeth and a small puckered up mouth. It was like a dog's bottom. How much sugar in your tea today, Grandma? George asked her. One spoon, she said, and no milk. And most grandmothers are lovely, kind, helpful old ladies, but not this one. She spent all day and every day sitting in her chair by the window, and she was always complaining and grousing, grouching, grumbling, griping about something or other. Never once, even on her best days, had she smiled at George and said, Well, how are you this morning, George? Or... Hey, why don't you and me have a game of snakes and ladders? Or, how was school today, George? She didn't seem to care about other people. She's a miserable old grouch. George went into the kitchen and made Grandma a cup of tea with a tea bag. He put one spoon of sugar in it and no milk. He stirred the sugar well and carried the cup into the living room. Grandma sipped the tea. It's not sweet enough, she said. Put more sugar in. So George took the cup back to the kitchen and added another spoonful of sugar. He stirred it again and carried it carefully into Grandma. Where's the saucer? She said. I won't have a cup without a saucer. So George fetched her a saucer. And what about a, a teaspoon, if you please? I stirred it for you, Grandma. I stirred it well. I'll stir my own tea, thank you very much, she said. Fetch me a teaspoon. So George fetched her a teaspoon. When George's mother or father were at home, Grandma never ordered George about like this. It was only when she had him on her own that she began treating him badly. You know what's the matter with you, the old woman said, staring at George over the rim of her teacup with those bright, wicked little eyes. You're growing too fast. Boys who grow too fast become stupid and lazy. I can't help it if I'm growing fast, Grandma, George said. Of course you can, she snapped. Growing's a nasty, childish habit. But we have to grow, Grandma. If we didn't grow, we'd never be grown ups. Grandma snorted. <coughs> Rubbish, boy. Rubbish. Look at me. Hmm? Am I growing? Certainly not. Ah, but you did once, Grandma. Only very little, the old woman answered. I gave up growing when I was extremely small, along with all the other nasty, childish habits, like laziness and disobedience and greed and sloppiness and untidiness and stupidity. You haven't given up any of those things, have you? Well, I'm still only a little boy, Grandma. You're eight years old, she snorted. <laughs> That's old enough to know better. If you don't stop growing soon, it'll be too late. Too late for what, Grandma? Well, shut up, George. It's ridiculous. You're nearly as tall as me already. George took a good look at Grandma. 
She certainly was a very tiny person. Her legs were so short, she had to have a footstool to put her feet on. And her head only came halfway up the back of the armchair. Daddy said it's fine for a man to be tall, George said. Don't listen to your daddy, said Grandma. You listen to me. But how do I stop myself growing? George asked her. You eat less chocolate, Grandma said. What, well, does chocolate make you grow? It makes you grow the wrong way, she snapped. Up instead of down. Grandma sipped some tea. Yeah. But she never took her eyes from the little boy who stood before her. Never grow up, she said. Always grow down. And stop eating chocolate. Eat cabbage instead. Well, cabbage? Oh, no. I don't like cabbage, said George. And it's not what you like or what you don't like, Grandma snapped. It's what's good for you that counts. From now on, you must eat cabbage three times a day. Mountains of cabbage. And if it's got caterpillars in it, so much the better. Ah, oh, said George. Oh, Mummy washes caterpillars down the sink. Yeah, well, Mummy's as stupid as you are, said Grandma. Cabbage doesn't taste of anything without a few boiled caterpillars in it. Slugs, too. Not slugs, George cried out. I couldn't eat slugs. Grandma squeezed her lips together tight so her mouth became a tiny wrinkled hole. Ooh, whenever I see a live slug on a piece of lettuce, I gobble it up quick before it crawls away. Delish us. <laughs> Worms and slugs and beetly bugs. You don't know what's good for you. <laughs> You're joking, Grandma. I never joke, she said. Beetles are perhaps the best of all. Well, they go crunch. Just imagine it. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you know, you get a beetle inside the stem of a stick of celery. Sometimes it's earwigs. A big, fat earwig is very tasty. But you've got to be very quick, my dear, when you put one of those in your mouth. It's got a sharp pair of nippers on its back end. And if it grabs your tongue with those, it never lets go. So you've got to bite the earwig first. Chop, chop, before it bites you. George started edging towards the door. He wanted to get as far away as possible from this filthy old woman. You're trying to get away from me, aren't you? She said, pointing a finger straight at George's face. You're trying to get away from Grandma. Could it be, George wondered, that she was a witch? He'd always thought witches were only in fairy tales, but now he wasn't so sure. Come closer to me, little boy, she said beckoning to him with a horny finger. Come closer to me and I will tell you secrets. Well, George didn't move. Grandma didn't move either. I know a great many secrets, she said. Her smile was thin and icy. The kind of smile a snake might make just before it bites you. George took a step backwards, edging closer to the door. You mustn't be frightened of your old grandma, she said, and leaned forward in her chair, whispering in a throaty sort of voice George had never heard her use before. Some of us have magic powers that can twist the creatures of this earth into wondrous shapes. A tingle of electricity flashed down the length of George's spine. He began to feel really frightened. Grandma went on. Some of us have fire in our tongues and sparks in our bellies and wizardry in the tips of our fingers. Some of us know secrets that would make your hair stand straight up on end and your eyes pop out of their sockets. George began to tremble. He wanted to run away, but his feet were stuck to the floor. We know how to make your nails drop off and teeth grow out of your fingers instead. We know how to make you wake up in the morning with a long tail coming out from behind you. We know secrets, my dear, about dark places where dark things live and squish and slither all over each other. Grandma, cried out George, stop! And he made a dive for the door. It doesn't matter how far you run, he heard her saying, you won't ever get away. George ran into the kitchen, slamming the door behind him. He was shaking a little. He really hated that horrid old witchy woman. But all of a sudden he had a tremendous urge to do something about her. Something whopping. Something absolutely terrific. A real shocker. 
sort of explosion. He wanted to blow away the witchy smell that hung around her in the next room. He may have only been eight years old, but he was a brave little boy. He was ready to take this woman on. I'm not going to be frightened by her, he said softly to himself. But he was frightened. And that's why he wanted suddenly to explode her away. Well, not quite away, but he did want to shake her up a bit. So what should it be, this whopping, terrific, exploding shocker for Grandma? George sat and thought for a while. He'd have liked to have put a banger under her chair. But he didn't have one. He would have liked to have put a long green snake down the back of her dress. But he didn't have a long green snake. He would have liked to have put six big black rats in the room with her and lock the door. But he didn't have six big black rats. And as George sat there, pondering this interesting problem, his eye fell upon the bottle of Grandma's brown medicine standing on the sideboard. Rotten stuff, it seemed to be. Four times a day, a large spoonful of it was shoveled into her mouth, and it didn't do her the slightest bit of good. She was always just as horrid after she'd had it as she'd been before. And the whole point of medicine, surely, was to make a person better. If it didn't do that, it was quite useless. Aha! thought George, suddenly. I know exactly what I shall do. I shall make her a new medicine. One that's so strong and so fierce and so fantastic that it'll either cure her completely or blow off the top of her head. I'll make her a magic medicine. A medicine no doctor in the world has ever made before. George looked at the kitchen clock. It said five past ten. There was nearly an hour left before Grandma's next dose was due at eleven. Here we go then, cried George, jumping up from the table. A magic medicine it shall be. So give me a bug and a jumping flea. Give me two snails and lizards three. And a slimy squiggler from the sea. And the poisonous sting of a bumblebee. And the juice from the fruit of the boo-boo tree. And the powdered bone of a wombat's knee. And one hundred other things as well, each with a rather nasty smell. I'll stir them up. I'll boil them long. A mixture tough. A mixture strong. And then, hey-ho, and down it goes. A nice big spoonful. Hold your nose. Just gulp it down and have no fear. And how do you like it, granny dear? Will she go pop? Will she explode? Will she go flying down the road? Will she go poof in a puff of smoke? Or will she start fizzing like a can of Coke? Who knows? Not I. Let's wait and see. I'm glad it's neither you nor me. Oh, Grandma, if you only knew what I have got in store for you. <laughs> Haha, -ha, what's in store for Grandma? You'll have to stay tuned because tomorrow you can set the second episode, get the second episode of George's Marvellous Medicine and what a marvellous story it is told by Rick Mayle. It's